started since uh, we've got uh, a pretty good crowd here right now. Uh, just wanted to reach out and say good morning or afternoon, wherever you might be in uh, North America today. Just thanks for spending a bit of your day with us uh, today as we start to uh, just kind of review a little bit of the brand spanking new Wiesman CI2, the Vita Crossel 200. Uh, specifically today, we're going to have a look at uh, the installation information. So we'll have a look at the installation manual. I've cut some of the information directly out of the manual there for us to have a look at today uh, and kind of add into that a little bit of kind of color and, and information just to kind of just uh, kind of pound those that the information into you so you've got it uh, down pretty good. We have been reviewing this uh, in kind of four separate uh, uh, online training uh, presentations. We had a general presentation. We've done that twice already. Uh, Patrick O'Brien did a great job. Uh, I think it was last week uh, on the uh, on that introduction to the uh, Vita Crossel CI2. Uh, Mark did a presentation last week on the application side of it. So that is really the precursor to this training here on the installation. He reviewed a lot of the different ways we can pipe the boiler and wire it and those types of things. So if you haven't taken in those two uh, bits of information they will they are archived they will be added on to our youtube channel so you can have a look at those a little bit later on and next week uh curtis is, is on deck to uh give us the last of the you know the part or a two of two of the startup and commissioning side of it so we're going to have a little bit of information related to that today as well but you really want to tune into that because he gets into a lot of their, um, I just, I'm going to steal a bit of his thunder, but he gets into a lot of the, the kind of like getting into the Wiesman account stuff and how to set all that stuff up because you're going to need to have a lot of that information, need to know how to do that, uh, especially if you're getting into the things like cascading the boilers and stuff like that. It's going to be very important that you kind of have that information down. So it's a really good, the first one was really good, really informative. I learned a lot on it. So uh, that's next week, I think May 11th, uh, Curse will be doing that. And just so it just so happens that I have these two gentlemen with me today, uh, they're going to keep me in line, make sure that, uh, you know, uh, I don't miss anything. So I'm sure you'll hear them chime in a few times today as we as we move through the things, just putting things into airplane mode and stuff before we start here. Uh, how are you guys doing today? Excellent. Good. Awesome. Uh, I, I didn't know keeping you in line was part of the job description. I want a pay raise. Well, it's like I say, it's just part of the part of the issue, right? It's like uh, you got to walk your dog a couple times a day. It's the same kind of thing. Keep <laughs> keep me on keep me in line. Keep me on that leash just as I go. Right. So I do tend to go off on tangents every so often. So I'll That's, try to keep those to a minimum. We like when you go off on tangents because we learn stuff that way. <laughs> We're going to uh, get going here. Uh, it's not a very long presentation. Uh, the installation information, uh, like I say, there's there, there's a bit of technical stuff to deal with here. But a full 30% of the manual is uh, uh, related to this is venting. So we're going to concentrate a lot on venting uh, when we talk about installation and, and stuff like that. Uh, eventually, someday we'll get into a service uh, webinar as well on these boilers. So first off, uh, this little slide has been part of, I think, of uh, pretty much everybody's presentation, but it's a very useful one, obviously. Uh, it's what are you going to get uh, when you purchase a CI2 boiler? as far as the size and capacities that we're, we're looking with. So some, some good technical information in this one slide. You're dealing with six possible boilers that you can purchase uh, and install in your facilities here. Uh, they're uh, from 399,000 BTUs, that magic number on that, uh, on that end, all the way up to a 2.0 million uh, BTU boiler. Uh, they come in different combinations. Obviously, they're single burners, as you see here. So the first four are basically going to come as a as a single burner unit. So one burner, one heat exchanger. Uh, the other units, the 1.5 to 2.0 million, are dual burner type of uh, boiler. So they're going to have a a, boiler, a burner at the top of the heat exchanger and a burner at the bottom of that heat exchanger as well. So they act as a as a single boiler. Uh, but you have the two burners on those particular boilers, and it kind of changes the dynamics of the of the combustion a little bit because you get some different turndown ratios as we move through here. 
Uh, so just keeping on those burners. Uh, at the smaller end there, you got about a seven and a half to one turn down ratio on that 399 uh, boiler. So from 50,000 BTUs on a low fire input. So that does some pretty small loads, especially in the, you know, considering the, the size of these boilers. Always up to 399,000 BTUs. And the boiler itself will also have 29 gallons of water in there. So they're a high mass boiler. The whole idea there is that the that that mass or volume of water is going to dampen the impact of changes in flow rates and demands and stuff like that. So it tends to reduce the cycling of the burners in operation, which is always a benefit for uh, boilers. The more they cycle, the less efficient the burner is going to be. So that high turndown ratio coupled with the mass of the boiler does a lot to ensure that we have a good cycle on these particular boilers. And it just gets better as we kind of move up here, as you're going to see. Uh, the next one in line there is the same pressure vessel, but the burner's a, a little higher output. So now we go to a 500,000 BTU boiler. Uh, so it has a higher turndown, uh, still down to 50,000 BTUs, but all the way up to 500,000 BTUs as far as its full output. The same capacity, 29 gallons there as well. Uh, then we move up to a, a larger uh, unit here. It's the uh, 750,000 BTU boiler a little bit more depth to this particular boiler, more uh, more plates added onto it for the for the more, for the bigger BTUs. Still a single burner and you're at that 10 to one turndown just like the 500,000 BTU boiler. So down to 75,000 up to 750,000 BTUs. So a pretty real uh, broad range there as far as the capability of that boiler to fire without basically cycling uh, to those lower BTU requirements. 1 million BTU boiler, we've got a single burner, 10 to one turndown ratio. 100,000 BTUs up to a million BTUs of, uh, of input. And then we get into the double deckers, we call them, the two burner systems. And 1.5 million uh, has a, a real high turndown. So we're at like a 30 to one turndown. It's because there's two different burners. We've got a 1 million BTU burner at the bottom of this boiler. And at the top, there's a 500,000 BTU uh, burner. So basically, you know, coupling with the, the math of, of turndowns there, you end up with uh, from 50,000 BTUs that, with the, the smaller burner, all the way up to 1.5 million BTUs with both those burners cranking out at, at a high fire output. So a real high turndown on that boiler. And also the uh, water volume in that unit is, uh, is the highest of all six. It's 119 gallons. Uh, so you have that high turndown and that volume of water there. So as, as far as cycling, I could see some fairly long cycle uh, rates on these particular boilers as far as uh, as operation. And then we have the 2.0 million. Uh, that's going to be two 1 million BTU burners basically stacked on top of each other, uh, which gives you a 20 to 1 turndown. And you still have a very respectable 99 gallons of water content in that boiler, not to mention the the, the metal in the boilers as well as we're going to review here in a little bit. So you couple the, the amount of metal and the amount of water in these units and you have a fairly large mass as far as, a, as an appliance goes here. A couple other things to look at. Uh, you've got an operating limit uh, of about 185 Fahrenheit, about 85 Celsius. And uh, that's basically not you know, where the boiler is always going to go to. It just depends on what your heat requirements are, but that's about the highest it's going to give you as far as an output. Uh, as far as operation. Uh, and we cap the fixed tie limit there at about 99C or about 210 Fahrenheit. So the boiler sensors are going to regulate that unit and not allow it to go above that temperature before it locks it out on a on a limit as far as a as a as a fault goes there, keeping the boiler in safe operation. So just a bit of information there uh, on the uh, unit as far as technical uh, documents. You know, you need to know obviously what what you're going to get and how many BTUs you're going to you're going to you're going to get out of that unit before you uh, you install it. So some good information to know ahead of time. This is the size or, or the weight of the boiler. So this this is with the burner uh, in there as well. But there's a, there's a lot of mass uh, just in the metal content in these boilers as well. Uh, 789 pounds of uh, you know boiler uh, comes on site here, but actually quite easy to move around as we're going to see in a little bit. Uh, the 399 to 500,000, uh, it will fit through an ab you know, a standard door, 29 and a half inches. You'll see that uh, at the bottom right here as we look at that uh, at the slide. Uh, the depth of the unit itself from the burner all the way to the back of the boiler, not including the uh, your piping and connections and venting and stuff you'll see at the back, uh, about 39 inches as far as the boiler goes. And a fairly simple boiler to work on. It's only, it's just under five feet tall as far as your, your cabinet goes and just a little over five feet where you, you have your connections at the top. 
Uh, the, uh, these two smaller units are a two inch MPT supply and return. Uh, your fuel connection uh, is one and a half inches on the back of the boiler. You see it connected to the back. So the other benefit is there's nothing on the sides of these units you have to deal with as far as service and stuff like that. So when we get into clearances, you can get these units fairly, especially in a multiple boiler installation, we got multiple CI2s, if you cross all 200s together, you can actually put these, squeeze these things almost, you know, basically like right up tight against each other. There's nothing on the sides we have to deal with as far as service. Uh, the, the vent itself where the, the uh, P-trap is connected, uh, you'll see a four inch diameter flue on these boilers as well. So they accept a four inch uh, exhaust connection at the back. And we're gonna talk about combustion air. It's a very, it's combustion air uh, is mentioned, I think as far as um, clean combustion air or contaminated combustion air, it's mentioned about seven times in the manual. So we take it fairly seriously what's coming into the boiler as far as combustion air. And you'll see the little knockout at the bottom here, where if you're gonna connect the boiler to uh, outside air, there is a conduit here that we can use to get that to the back of the unit. So essentially everything is front of the boiler as far as, as uh, you know access, back of the boiler as far as access, and the top of the boiler. Uh, the sides, basically there's nothing there that we need to deal with, just a pretty gray color. Vito Graffite, they call it. The uh, 750 to 1 million BTU boiler. So these again, still single burners we're dealing with here. We, we're up to 963 pounds. Uh, there is more depth to this boiler. That's the, the big thing you have a look at here. We're at 47 and a quarter inches, basically from the burner to the back of the boiler now. Uh, so more plates, more heat exchange surface area there. Uh, so more weight to the unit, but still the same uh, uh, width. So still 29 and a half inches as far as width. So still going to go through that door fairly easily to kind of get it in place. So a really uh, decent footprint for the size of the, you know, the, the horsepower, the BT this boiler is going to give you. Uh, still basically, you know, under, under five feet tall, as far as a, uh, as far as the boiler, as far as, a, you know, what you need to get access to. So you're not gonna have to get up on a ladder to do any type of work on these units. It's really easy to wire them in the back and, and do your service in the front of these units. Uh, the uh, back of the unit, just important differences here uh, compared to the previous two models. Uh, you have a two and a half inch ANSI flange connection uh, for the supply and return. Uh, so your companion flange and your gaskets, those are going to be field supply. They don't come with the boiler. We, we basically send you the, the, the ANSI flange to the top. It's up to you as the contractor there, essentially you get the, the, the proper gasket and flange connections there to, to do your uh, connection to your system. We still have a one and a half inch fuel connection at the back there, and these are dual fuel boilers, so natural gas or propane. Uh, and we have a six inch flue now. So we've gone up from four inch in the 399 to 500. Now we're at a six inch flue for 750 to 1 million B2 boiler. And to just round out the, you know, the, the top two here, the next uh, two uh, boilers, we've got the 1.5 million and the 2 million B2 boiler. There are some differences here. We got to uh, mention, obviously uh, you've got, um, you know, the weight uh, difference or, or not the weight difference, the other uh, weight difference, sorry, 18 and 12 pounds, 1.5. We've got more heat exchanger area uh, as far as passageways. So that's basically uh, adds more weight, 969 pounds. And that also takes up some water content as well. That's why the boilers are different as far as the volume of water. With, fluor, with fewer flue gas passageways, there's more area for the water to be inside the boiler. And uh, that's where you get the higher capacity of water in the smaller uh, 1.5 million BTU boiler here. A uh, little taller, so we're up uh, basically uh, over a little over six feet in height. Uh, so still not, uh, you know, not as far as the size of these boilers, as far as capacity, that's not very tall as far as the boiler goes. It's still 29 and a half inches wide. So it's still going to fit through those doors, make it easy for you to get these uh, things into a boiler room is always a challenge when we start talking about these big commercial boilers. So we're making that a little bit easier for you. And the depth is a, uh, a significantly different here uh, from the previous models as well. Obviously bigger boiler, more, uh, more heat exchanger. Uh, so from the back of that flange to the front of the boiler, we have uh, 56 and a quarter inches overall uh, depth there uh, for us to work with. And then at the back, we've got our four inch ANSI flange here now. So again, your gaskets and your uh, companion flanges for that are going to be uh, basically bought at the, your, your friendly local wholesaler. You've got uh, your two inch diameter uh, fuel connection on the back of the boiler again. So these boilers as well, or everything's front, back or, 
or and that's it basically there's nothing on the top of these units either uh, so just front or back we have to worry, worry about and the difference in the back between the two sizes will be the vent so we're still at a six inch uh, diameter vent for the um, exhaust on the 1.5 million. We're up to eight inches now on the 2.0 million BTU boiler as far as the, the, that, uh, that size or capacity. And we're not reducing those uh, vent sizes. Those are gonna be staying that particular size or larger depending on what you, what you need there as far as a uh, length of run. You don't see a, a same knockout at the back as we had on the smaller boilers with these bigger ones. There's a different way we connect the combustion air. We're going to review that so you, you're fairly confident when you get to a site what you're going to need to do uh, before you get there. So we're going to review that as we move through how we connect combustion air to these particular boilers. Now, the units also come with a trim kit, uh, you know, installation package, we call it. Uh, we've already reviewed 40% uh, of this slide before we even got here. So the first two, one and two there are just your return and supply information for the boilers. Uh, but as far as the safety header in the green that we see on the left and right, in the little circle there, uh, all of the components you see in the list are part of that uh, boiler trim kit basically or addressing. So we're going to address that safety header up. Uh, what we're going to include in that little safety header are obviously things that deal with safety of operation of the boiler. So you're going to see a relief valve is part of that package. We've got the a relief valve in there. It comes with an 80 PSI relief valve, but there are alternate uh, relief valves that are available. So you need to contact us and let us know if you're going to need a different uh, you know, relief valve. So during the design of the system and whatever, uh, that would uh, basically be need to know. And otherwise, when we ship it out, if we don't know that you need something smaller, you're going to get this, that you're going to get that 80 PSI relief valve. You're going to have to basically uh, uh, purchase a, another relief valve if you don't let us know to, to reduce that pressure down. But notice that it's in a vertical. So basically, we give you all the piping connections there and elbows to make sure that when you pipe that relief valve in, that it's piped in in a vertical uh, orientation. That's what we want to see. As well, uh, when you're connecting uh, this to a floor, or basically uh, piping uh, off of the relief valve, we're not going to reduce the diameter of that piping connection to the outlet of that relief valve. So whatever size you get, you want to maintain that, that opening because we need to make sure we leave the, the correct amount of capacity when that relief valve opens. We don't want to bottleneck it. And typically those are piped down to a floor drain, you know, leaving about six inches or so of space between the floor drain and, and, the, uh, and the piping connection there, just so you can see if, there, if there's actually a leak or whatever, you can actually detect it. You don't want that connector right inside the floor drain, a little bit more difficult to see if you've got a leak in that, uh, in that connection. And that can be very expensive. If you don't notice that your boiler is really foul, it has tripped and that's leaking down to a drain that you don't see. That can be very costly as far as your, uh, as your, um, as your fuel uses, et cetera. So we want to make sure that's piped correctly. Uh, we give you a, a basically a, a air vents for the top of the boiler. Obviously, uh, you need to get air out of your hydronic systems here, and uh, having a air vent at the highest temperature point in the boiler is always a, a useful area where air is going to be uh, basically uh, uh, basically eliminated from the system at that point. Your low water cutoff, which comes with the trim kit as well, is part of that safety header, and that's going to be installed right at this point. So there's no area there that you can put an isolation valve in between the low water cutoff and the boiler, which is, we don't want to see that. So putting it in this area is always a, a recommended location. You can put it in a different area if that's desirable, uh, but of course you can't isolate that, uh, have the ability to isolate your low water cutoff from the boiler. So it adds a bit of challenge there, depending on where you're putting that uh, low water cutoff. And there's also a pressure uh, gauge, temperature gauge. Uh, so some visual uh, identification of pressure and temperature in the boiler. Even if the display is, is powered down, you're still gonna see that on that little gauge there, what your pressure and temperature are. And we also give you, uh, you know, boiler drains for the back of the units. So depending on the size of that drain, you're gonna get the reducing couplings that will match that. Uh, and it's a three quarter inch uh, drain that we give you for the back. And finally, an isolation valve for the gas line. So basically just the isolation valve is, is in there and it's of the appropriate size for the size of the boiler that you guys are gonna be working with in that particular area. So that kind of just reviews what you're gonna get and how we dress that, that, uh, that uh, safety header up there to make sure that all those things are in place and that we can get that boiler in a safe operation. 
Now, if you uh, had a chance to look at the or, or, uh, or take in the presentation uh, a couple weeks ago, that Patrick did on the on the inst basically kind of an introductory kind of a, a real broad overview of the the new Vita Processor 200 CI2. Uh, you would see uh, that there was an ability for us to basically use the existing SCID and the components of the SCID as a ramp uh, for to basically uh, have the blur slide off the ramp and basically you can slide it into place. Uh, he actually had a video, so he one up me on this one here. So he had a really nice video, but it, it basically when I saw the video, it's like that's exactly what I would assume that would look like as far as how to basically roll this blur off. So with no surprises at all when I saw it. So basically we're gonna remove the packaging and take off the brackets basically that hold the packaging together there. You see them down here in the bottom with the one and the two, um, we'll show that. You're gonna remove that little ramp and you're just gonna set it aside. Uh, and then uh, we're going to basically make sure that the caster, so when the, when the boiler is delivered on the skid, the leveling legs are already basically, you know, the, are, are, the landing gear has already been basically uh, opened up here. So the, the, le the legs are already in place there to keep the boiler stable as it's in transport. You're going to want to grab your wrench and basically uh, make sure those leveling legs, all four of them are, are up. So we're going to basically make sure that when you raise these up, the actual uh, wheels come down here. So you can see the different wheel configurations that we have on the bottom of the boilers, depending on the size that you're dealing with here. So once you uh, lift the uh, leveling legs up, so they're not basically on the on the pallet anymore on the skid, the legs are dropped down here, and now you can start to move that boiler. Uh, so we would put the little ramp down, and then. Uh, recommendation there is to have uh, two people uh, just because you don't want this thing to you know run away or whatever but you have two people carefully slide that now using the the wheels and slide it down the ramp and then into place but I, 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 when I saw the video it's exactly what you would think it was pretty straightforward pretty easy as far as uh, basically getting that uh, boiler off the skid and basically wheeling into place so it looked pretty impressive to me as far as that uh, uh, as far as having those wheels and, and fairly useful uh, getting that into a uh, system for installation. Uh, when we talk about water, uh, when we install the boiler, obviously, hopefully we're going to put some some sort of fluid in it to make sure that we can get the uh, heat out of the boiler and into the system here. That 80 PSI relief valve that comes standard with it, uh, basically 80 PSI equals about 180, just a little under 185 feet of vertical head that we are, you know, uh, can deal with there. So depending on the story, so everybody has a different story, depending on where you're at here. In some areas, the, you know, the story is a little bit shorter because they want to add more, more floors to the building. So they've started to basically make the stories a little bit, you know, shorter, you know, a couple feet here and there. All of a sudden now you got a seven, eight story building. Now you got a, you know, a nine story building. That's kind of what uh, is going on out there. So depending on the height of your stories in your buildings, uh, you get an idea uh, with the uh, the blue and the green information there on the just below the 80 psi maximum operating pressure. So uh, if you were keeping within about 80% of your relief valve uh, basically relieving, so about 64 pounds, a lot of people like to use that little magic number. Uh, if you had a 10 foot per story building, we could do about uh, 15 stories uh, you know, a 15 story building uh, with 12 feet, you're down to 12 stories at uh, 15 feet per story. You're at 10 stories as far as overall height of a building. General recommendation there looking at it. If we bump that up to 70 PSI, we can get an extra floor. Or so out of the uh, out of the uh, out of the boiler there before we get, you know, to a point where you're getting a little bit close to the relief pressure capacity of that unit. And just a note, uh, there's nothing in the boiler that has a pressure switch or anything else like that that's going to detect if you have lower than 15 pounds in the boiler. Uh, the recommendation of minimum water pressure you see at the bottom of the uh, right hand side there of the slide uh, is a recommendation for safe operation. Uh, so when you get into these higher temperatures uh, and you know 185 Fahrenheit, and you know and and you know if there's some issue there where we're getting a little bit higher for some reason, lack of flow or some other problem going on. And the boiler starts to creep up above that 185 and getting closer to tripping the, the fixed high limit. The closer you are to steam uh, pressure, basically, the, you know, the, the more um, you know, 
more problematic your trip in that fixed high limit might be. So the 15 pounds is a minimum kind of keeps that when you start, when you trip a relief valve at uh, 210 Fahrenheit, and you got 15 pounds of pressure there, tends to keep the boiler from percolating a little bit. So no kettling uh, tends to happen or, or as severe with a little higher pressure in the boiler. And also most of your pressure tanks, your expansion tanks that you guys are working with there, if you look at them, most of them are already pre-charged to about 12 pounds or so minimum. Uh, so you having 15 pounds in, uh, of pressure in your boiler, just make sure that those uh, expansion tanks, the bladders are properly flexed in the expansion tanks, et cetera, for, for operation. Uh, other things to look at, when we're talking about filling the boiler, the system there. So obviously, well, not obviously, it's but it's it's something we want to mention here that it's these are basically suitable. These boilers are suitable for closed loop high, hot water heating systems with pumps. So we're forcing flow through the system with circulators. Uh, you may need to look at uh, treatment of the boiler uh, water. Uh, so when you're putting it in there, so to, specifically if you have issues and you know known errors or problems of high you know hard water, uh, a lot of dissolved solids in your system or, or in your water. Uh, you'd want to have that checked out to make sure that you're within the you know, compliance of our uh, of the requirements of our boiler. Uh, the service manual has more information on that specifically, as far as what looking in there for you know, dissolved solids, etc. Uh, we recommend magnetic filtration. So a lot of uh, very good hydronic specialty companies are out there making uh, you know these air separator and magnetic uh, you know. Um, uh, separators you know, all in one. And uh, like I say, they are a real valuable uh, source, but basically, especially if you've got some issues with uh, you know dirt in your systems. If you've got uh, an area where you're freezing, we're in the Great White North here. So there's lots of our uh, areas in this uh, in Canada here where we do have systems that are completely glycoled. Uh, recommendation is no more than 50-50 mixture uh, to make sure. And that's not always a necessity. I mean, in our area, uh, basically, we could probably, uh, you know, less than 30% uh, mixture of glycol to water in uh, in um, the lower mainland here is more than acceptable. In some areas, you might have to look at 50-50, depending on what your uh, what that cold temperature is in your particular area. But 50-50 is what we recommend as your max. And if this is not a new installation, so if you are basically hooking up a boiler to an existing system, there are some recommendations there. Obviously, we don't want the, the legacy of the old boiler that's still stuck in the piping of that system, they end up back in the new boiler because that's going to turn the new boiler into an old boiler fairly quickly. We want to make sure that we reduce that inform that uh, that problem that that probability. So basically, any deposits and stuff like that that uh, that are in the system that get into the boiler can cause some serious problems actually, and those problems are not warrantable. Which means that that would be on the dime of the person that didn't look at the manual and take heed as far as what we're what we're dealing with here. So. Uh, in page eight of the installation manual, they mentioned something in there about flushing uh, the uh, system out with about 50 to 60 pounds of water pressure to remove the sludge and, and contaminants under that uh, particular piping or connections. So we don't want the boiler connected to that system as you're doing that. So we're not flushing through the boiler here. That would be flushing out the existing piping before we open the boiler up to that system. Getting into our clearances now, uh, which uh, if you look at it here, there's really no clearances as far as combustibles. You could put the boiler on a combustible floor if you want. That combustible floor obviously is, has to be load bearing. So we have, you know, because we have some fairly hefty weights here. So we're adding the water to the metal content of the boilers. You know, you're up over a thousand pounds, even on the smallest boiler. And we're pretty close to 3,000 pounds when we get to about 2. million here. So it's, we need to make sure that we got something that, the, that, that will be able to hold that type of weight, plus all the other, you know, whatever else is in that mechanical room. But no clearances to combustibles. So front, back, sides uh, of the boiler, there's no issues there. Uh, as far as the venting, uh, you have to follow the vent manufacturer's recommendations. Whatever it says on the venting must be adhered to. We don't have the zero clearance uh, uh, as we do on some of our other products here with the vent manufacturers. Uh, we can supersede that. We are now going to follow the vent manufacturer recommendations on these particular uh, that, that particular uh, exhaust venting. Uh, the Footprint of the boilers here, whether it's on a pad or on the floor itself, you see that down on the bottom. So the widths are all the same. So 39 and a half inches wide, 
is the footprint. And then you see the depth of the boilers, uh, depending on the smaller one at 32 inches, all the way up to 47.25 inches. We kind of looked at that stuff a little bit uh, uh, with the uh, dimensioning earlier. But you see that, how that lays out on, a, on the footprint here. Now, when we get into seismic uh, brackets and stuff like that with these boilers, that, that footprint may be a little bit different when you start putting in seismic. I know on the West Coast here, uh, that will be part of the packages here with most boilers is some sort of seismic re restraints. So you'd have to consider that uh, in that overall footprint as well. Uh, when we get into that, that side of it. The uh, clearance you see on the... Uh, on the slide here from front to back to sides, uh, the one on the front here, 39 and a half inches of service clearance. That's to get in front of the board to do you know, maintenance and service, to open up the doors and stuff like that. But these, uh, these doors are fairly thin. So it's not like you need a whole lot of room to remove the cover off the boiler. They literally slide off and, and out of place here. They're only about an inch or so thick. So very simple here. The idea is to give yourself some good clearance in the front there that you can do maintenance. Because a lot of the stuff you're gonna deal with will be right at the front of the boiler. Uh, also need to get around to the sides of the unit. Uh, so whether it's standalone or, or, or multiple boilers in a boiler room, you need to get around to the back because again, there's a lot of wiring at the back, your venting, uh, your siphon for your, P, uh, for your condensate and stuff are in the back of the units. Uh, so these are things we wanna inspect. Uh, so we, wanna, we have to make sure that we can get to the back and easily kind of look at things and inspect it. So there's some recommendations there uh, on that side as well, right out of the manual itself. Uh, and the mechanical room itself, about 40 C, is this is as far as a sustainable, you know, temperature. You know, not like it, it spikes here and there, but as far as a, you know, uh, you know, sit in that boiler in that steam room for you know 365 days a year, all of its life is def definitely going to have some impact. So you know, keeping that temperature down below 40 C is recommend recommended. If we get into multiple boilers, so these are not in the manual. Just some, uh, just some. Um, you know, just some helpful hints as far as piping the boilers or, or getting them off the wall or, or areas where we, we have to get around the boiler to make sure we can easily uh, have a look at the, you know, the back of the units here. Uh, so you see that, that, that 31 and a half inches clearance from the back of the boiler to the, uh, to the green little uh, rectangle there that I put in the, in the slide. It doesn't give you a whole lot of space there if you were right up against that green uh, line there as far as that's the back of the wall. So adding a bit of space there, make sure that we can get to the back without any issues and do any type of inspection. Or you can space the boilers out a bit depending on your configuration and change the venting around a little bit there to basically configure it so that you can get them a little bit tighter together, uh, but you'll have good access to all of the, um, all of the back of the boiler for any type of uh, requirements there for maintenance and stuff because there are things like you know the venting you want to inspect that for leaks you know the breaching there as well for any leaks uh you got some sensors back there uh that you're going to have you, you're going to want to be able to have a look at and monitor a lot uh, basically a majority of your wirings at the back there too there are some a little bit of wiring in the front that we're going to have a look at but most of the stuff is really at the back of the board as far as your installation um set up there you're going to need to get to the back of that unit when we have the boiler finally in place, you've rolled it off of that skid down the, that, uh, that basically ramp that's included free of charge with the boiler. And you get that rolling into place there. And now you wanna basically land it in the, the spot and park it. Once you get into the place, you're looking to basically uh, install the boiler. Uh, now we need to put the landing gear back down. So we need to level those legs up. Uh, there's a little, um, just a little level on the, um, bottom of the boiler on the legs there. It basically it gives you a real good assistance there to make sure that all those legs are properly leveled. Uh, very important, simple little thing to basically to deal with. You wouldn't think much about it, obviously, but leveling as plumbers is a very important thing to that we think about. It's one of the, you know, it's basically what where plum comes from. And uh, so we need to make sure this is level. If it's not, if you've never seen, if you've ever seen a boiler or never seen a uh, boiler that wasn't level when it operates, if you put a hula hoop around it, it would actually, I think a lot of times it would actually maintain the hula hoop in, in suspension. Just It looks like like it's basically wiggling its hips to have that uh, hula hoop go around and around. So it looks kind of odd. So you want to make sure those legs are level so it doesn't do that type of, of uh, kind of wiggling around in the boiler room as it's in operation. And we give you that little leveling, uh, a level there to make sure that doesn't happen. 
when we get into the digital side of the of the world here, so something added on to all of our our, our new one source or uh, uh, boilers here is the uh, is the uh, digital tools or digital capabilities. They all come with uh, the telemetry units uh, installed on them, so they're ready to you know with a hotspot already built into these boilers for connection to. Uh, the systems router for uh, you know for remote communication uh, with the system whether that's the owner or the uh, contractor. Uh, in order to do this, uh, we need a, a particular app or service, digital service for Vsmen, and I put that information in here, the V guide. Uh, we have this an app, but we also have the ability if you want to hard connect into your boiler. Understand that uh, mechanical rooms, uh, commercial mechanical rooms, can be like vaults sometimes, where the ability to you know to to, to connect to anything remotely is near impossible. Uh, there is a LAN connection at the back of the boiler that you can hard connect your laptop to, whatever it is. And uh, if we're commissioning that boiler uh, using you know V Guide, and uh, or we want to connect to the outside world at that point, we can do that now uh, with the uh, field land supply land connection. So something extra in these uh, these Vita Crossel 200 CI2s is also a hard connection uh, as, well, as well as the wireless connection, just to make that a little bit easier uh, to make sure that you know these uh, devices can be programmed and stuff and set up without, with as minimal uh, problems as particularly possible. So we gave you a little bit of information in the manual here in these slides about you know recommended locations of the router and you know different problems with you know different you know uh, angles of the you know uh, boilers uh, hotspot to your router that sort of thing uh, to kind of keep in mind. Uh, Curtis will have a review of you know that uh, whole idea of the 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 V Guide app and uh, the idea of the Vsmen account. So if if this is of interest and if you're interested in these boilers, that's a particular interest will be this side of it as well. Uh, have a look at uh, attending on May 11th to make sure that you get that information that we're that we're going to give you. Uh, some other simple things to think about, just removing the cover off of the boiler. Uh, these are, again, the, I think probably the, as far as boiler uh, enclosures and covers go, these are, I think, the, well, definitely the thinnest ones I've ever seen Wiesman uh, deal with. Our previous boilers, you had a fairly big jacket work with. Even the uh, current CM2 uh, boiler, uh, you know, that, that, that jacket's still probably about uh, the, on the vestibule is probably three or four inches uh, thick. This one here is even thinner than that still. Uh, but very rigid, you know, pretty robust door. Uh, in order to get those doors off, uh, there's there's a couple steps here. So if we look at the one on the left hand side, this is a smaller size boilers. Uh, on the right hand side, we're dealing with more with the the double decker, the two burner uh, boilers that we have available. But on the right side, uh, I just took a picture uh, of the top of one of these units. So looking down at that kind of a bird's eye view, you can actually slide this cover back. And you see the little hole right here. I think that hole is, is depicted in the uh, in the picture as well, just on the above with the screwdriver. You just pop that screwdriver down that little hole, and that's going to basically allow you to open that door up at that particular point in time to, to basically releases the door from the uh, from the boiler. And to slide it back in again, you just put the the uh, the bottom of the door, put it into place, and just push it into place, and it clicks back. As far as the larger, there's two doors in the larger boiler. So there's the top door first. It has a little handle that you can flip up. So when you look at the, the kind of default position of the top of that, uh, these boilers, you'll see this little flat kind of area here. You push that down with your with your finger and you'll actually, uh, when it flips around 180 degrees, it's now a handle. So you can pull up on that handle to a point and then there's going to be a catch here. And thanks to Mark for, for supplying this picture. I didn't have this one last time, uh, but you'll have this little area here. When you lift that up, it only goes to a certain point. You don't want the door to fly off or whatever. So there's a catch here. Take your little screwdriver, poke in the hole there, and that will release the catch. So now you can fully take that top door uh, off. And then the bottom door is exactly the same oops, as the uh, one over to the left here. So once you get that top door off, there's just the two little holes on the above the control here. You put your screwdriver in there and you can release the catches for the bottom door. And it comes off exactly the same way as the smaller boiler door did uh, that I showed you earlier. 
to access the electrical components, which are at the back of the unit. So this would be a lot of your field wiring back here. We're going to review pumps and valves and stuff like that, that we're going to be uh, working with. Uh, the smaller boilers have an access panel that basically goes from top to bottom, a little hinge that basically once you remove a couple of screws at the top, you can hinge that down and that gives you access to the different uh, controls, uh, devices that you're going to have to wire to there and your DIN rail. And on the right hand side, your larger boilers, we have the uh, two screws there. Uh, when you open it up, it goes from basically from left to right uh, hinge basically on the, on the vertical. So just a different configuration, but the same type of, of uh, stuff is in that area. So what you're exposing when you get this uh, opened up will be the multi-zone input outboard board uh, in there, uh, the wiring panel and your DIN rails. So those are gonna be areas that you're gonna wire to. You're gonna wire to all these different areas of the boiler, depending on what you're dealing with there. And we do give you some, uh, we've been doing this for a few years now, and I go to a lot of job sites. I see that uh, the guys are catching on with these, uh, these little schematics. They're not little, actually, they're a fairly large document. Really easy to see, especially for old guys like me that they're, you know, their eyes are fixed now. We got to kind of move the paper in and out because our eyes don't focus anymore. Uh, don't have a long enough arm to look at a lot of these, uh, a lot of these wiring schematics that you see in a lot of manuals and stuff. But this is a large scale drawing, and points out every connection to the DIN rails, to the uh, you know, different boards on the control, uh, to make sure that you see that information. And it's got a legend in there as well. You can depict where everything's going to go there. And I see a lot of guys now. Well, I literally tape this to the side of the boiler as they're doing their installation, so they can reference it, just like a just like a map, a road map. We've laid that out and then we're gonna detail our, our basically our journey, uh, basically the end of that installation uh, and then basically uh, turn that over to the guy that's gonna start it up for us. So there's your, uh, the different schematics that we're gonna, that could be possible with each boiler, you know, four, four different, you know, footprints of boilers or capacity of the boilers, there's gonna be four different uh, schematics. Uh, and those basically come with every one of the boilers. Just a quick review, what you would see uh, on those uh, schematics. Uh, the DIN rail that comes on the back of the smaller boilers is what we'll review here first. And you'll see that the uh, DIN rail has a, a couple of fuses in pink there. There are 6.3 amp fuses that are part of the DIN rail. We'll have a look at how to access those in a second. Uh, your main power for the boiler is going to be wired to this DIN rail. You see that? That's the first thing on the left-hand side. We bring our power in to the unit. Uh, the next thing to the right, uh, as we move right there, is going to be the low water cutoff connection uh, for power. So that goes to the uh, number four terminal, and we, and we neutral it on the six. And the low water cutoff basically safety is wired to 16 and 17. So that is the switch basically that opens to, to basically uh, stop the boiler from operation. So that lower cutoff can be installed in there. If we're dealing with a vent damper on the boiler, so why would we have a vent damper? We're gonna talk about that kind of close to the end of the, of the discussion today, but that's for common venting. Each boiler would have a damper in, uh, basically added to it. Uh, if there's no damper, you would just see a jumper between 18 and 19 there. Uh, but if you have a damper, and we're going to show this, I'm going to show you a little wiring of one in a, as we move forward there, then of course the proof of that damper opening would be basically replacing the jumper on 18 and 19. If it doesn't open, it doesn't close completely, and of course the burner is not allowed to fire until we get that proof. If we have multiple boilers and you're uh, basically using isolation valves, when that boiler is off, the isolation valve is closed, we have no flow through the boiler, uh, then the isolation valve would be wired to 22 uh, to 24, or grounding on 23. And we also have a pump output. So a boiler pump specifically is what we're dealing with here. And that's a high efficiency boiler pump capability. There's also the ability of feeding a zero to 10 volt input in there uh, for modulation of that pump for variable speed capability. Uh, and uh, delta T uh, functionality on that boiler pump as well. So that would be uh, something that, you know, depending on your applications, that might be desirable, or maybe you go with the isolation valve and you have a system pump that you're dealing with as far as variable flow, et cetera. I will mention also polarity sensitivity. Uh, anytime you have a flame rectification, so we're basically proving flame uh, with an ionization signal, we wanna make sure that we are wiring the correct line voltage 
uh, the hot goes to line and of course the the neutral is tied off the neutral there if we reverse that you can get into issues with operation of your uh, um, flame safety uh, having issues there that would drive you crazy so keep that polarity correct on the larger boilers it's essentially the same uh there's a couple of extra areas in the din rail because we've got two burners so a little bit uh more going on here but we've kept the they kept the uh, consistency of the numbering so that there's no difference between the larger din rail and the smaller ones so uh, when we tie power off to the larger boilers it goes the exact same area of the din rail as it did on the uh, smaller units low water cutoff vent damper isolation valve and the uh, smart or the boiler pump as well all tie off to the same numbers on the din rails so there's no difference in those in operation it's just that if we look at the uh, they've basically taken off a couple of those uh, and added them uh, those uh, areas to the din rail here on the on the larger ones so as far as wiring goes the the numbers are all the same on the din rails so that the, the things that are pertinent to you guys with the fuses, there's uh, on this one, there's three fuses. The smaller one, there's two fuses. But you'll see down the bottom left here uh, that you can actually, where the area of the fuse is, there's a little spot on the top here you can pry apart. And you'll actually, it's on a hinge here. You can tilt it down. So you see the little area there that snaps into our uh, DIN rail enclosure. And I can flip the side open. And inside of here is the 6.3 amp fuse kind of tucked away inside of there. So for access, you just pop that. Uh, uh, enclose the din rail down and pop the cover off the side there and your fuse is kind of tucked in in the side of that so the other fuses what we're dealing with we get into the mzio board and the wiring panel board here to the right uh, these are other um, areas that we're looking at and uh, you've got five pump outputs but there's uh, two 6.3 amp fuses so we look at the first uh, part and this is where Mark kind of reviewed a lot of these applications like when are you going to use these zone pumps or heating circuit pumps so those you know the domestic hot water pumps uh, a lot of that was all of it was covered brilliantly actually in the application or yeah application uh, presentation last week so he basically gives you a whole rundown of when you would use these and when they change uh, based on programming but I'll do a quick review here just to kind of get it going more on the installation side of it so if i'm looking at adding multiple pumps here i've got to remember i am protected to 6.3 amp uh, fuses if those pumps are larger than about two amps a piece kind of the general rule of thumb uh, that we recommend we would want to put a contactor in between the switching output here so if we're doing the uh, on the left hand side here we have zone pump one zone pump two zone pump three and we're using those but those are larger than two amps as far as capacity, I would want to use a contactor and separate. So I'd switch the uh, a 120 volt contactor. Like I could switch that off of the zone pump output here and then take my power from a different source and I could actually operate that pump safely. So I'm not going to pop the fuse or put any load on that fuse that's unnecessary, putting the contactor in play there. If I'm dealing with, uh, you know, commercial systems here, you might also be dealing with, you know, different voltages from 120. It might be in 208, you know, 230 volt. Uh, again, you can switch with a 120 volt contactor uh, to those particular pumps. We show those schematics down here in the bottom. That's why I'm kind of reviewing it a little bit. And you get into some really large systems there, and that's possible if you get some big, um, you know, you know, big boiler rooms here, multiple boilers, etc. You might get into three phase systems, and of course, we can still switch off the uh, contactor and wire those three phase pumps. We can still use the control to switch these. But we're not going to impact the fuses that are that are built into the particular board. So something to kind of keep in mind there is, you know, re reviewing the pumps and reviewing the uh, the outputs here to make sure we're not overloading those fuses. Uh, one that I want to mention here as well is the F2 fuse. I put it in red here, and this is a uh, not 6.3 amp. It's a one amp fuse, slow blow here. But if you're wiring stuff with the power on. And you can short that fuse out fairly easily. And I speak from experience. So basically, uh, the idea there, when you're wiring, you know, combustion air, uh, you know, damper or something like that to your boiler here, uh, boiler on this spot here, or you're wiring safety outputs that you might be able to use, you know, things like, well, I'll review these uh, as we move through here, but things like lower high gas pressure switches and stuff, you can use these contacts as safeties, these ZI1, ZI2, or Z2I and Z3I are also safety outputs if you're not using them for zone inputs. Uh, the 
uh, F2 fuse, if you power the system down, you're not gonna hurt it, but there is the ability of, uh, you know, for, fairly easily to short that out if you, you touch two wires together with voltage there and, and you blow that fuse. Uh, and you would end up with a combustion air fault when you power the boiler up. So it's fairly apparent if you uh, power the boiler up and you have that combustion air uh, fault and you wired it with the power on, you were probably short of that little F2 fuse. You have to get another uh, one amp fuse. Uh, so other connections, uh, if you're doing primary secondary, this TS1 is important. Obviously we're gonna have, uh, we wanna monitor system temperature, supply temperature, as much as boiler temperature here. So we wanna make sure we have a sensor out there picking up that supply. Uh, we can also operate zero to 10 for things like uh, floating set points. Uh, some, uh, a lot of commercial systems with building automation, they'll, they'll float a 10 volt signal to, to turn the burner on at a specific set point. You can also put a zero to 10 volt here to, for burner modulation as well. So you can do both uh, either or here on that particular plug. So zero to 10 volt and right above it, there's an output. Uh, so if you're doing DDC and you want to see what the burner percentage is, you're going to get a, a, a DC voltage signal that you can convert to very easily to percentage. So if you saw three volts on this output on your system, then you know your, your, burner, your boiler's at about 30% of its capacity. So it's a nice little feature that we have added into that for operation. We'll talk about the, the pink 74 plug in a second as we go through different accessories. Uh, but as we get into the farther right here on the wiring panel, you've got your outdoor air sensor on the one and two connection. So if you're gonna use the boiler's outdoor reset functionality, which it's very capable of doing, you need an outdoor air sensor connection and it's gonna go one and two. Domestic hot water connections, whether it's a, a switch or we're dealing with a sensor, you're gonna have that on three and four and you're gonna program the boiler when you commission it for all these things. And then five and six could be things like a field blocking of the boiler. So in some systems, they wanna block the burner or a boiler from operation, you know, different times of year maybe or something, they, 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 they basically block uh, systems and open them up when they need them. Uh, you have the ability of a hard connection here at five and six, you close that contact and program it for uh, blocking. It's gonna basically uh, stop that burner from firing. We could also do calls for heat for others, an extra zone circuit there. There's a couple of different functionalities in this 96 plug that we can utilize. And then we have domestic pumps and heating circuit uh, output pumps here on the P1 and P2. And of course the power that's coming from a DIN rail uh, and of course powering up of the NZIO board here on the 40 plug. So fairly straightforward uh, wiring. We reviewed it a few times, uh, but uh, you know, never hurts to go over it one more time. As far as accessories go, uh, when we're installing a system here, depending on, you know, rather simplistic systems without a whole lot of, you know, uh, added, uh, you know, accessories, things like mixing valves and stuff like that, that's fairly straightforward. We've got our MZIO board here we talked about, and then our wiring panel board over here, uh, standard, um, comes standard with the particular unit. And we would have a look at, uh, you know, the different applications that we have available on how we would wire this out, depending on, you know, you know the different ways we pipe the boilers, et cetera. When we get into uh, you know, adding more complexity to systems, so your system itself requires more temperatures for the heating system, uh, those types of things. We do have accessories that you can add on to these Vito Crosso 200 CI2 boilers. Uh, they're called, uh, you know, there could be things like mixing uh, valve requirements here. You might have, you might need extra pump outputs and those are uh, available in accessories. So we call them ADIO boards. Uh, they come basically with a, a different, um, a different uh, number based on what you're looking for or different identity. But these ADIO boards could be mixing valve extension kits. Uh, they could be pump outputs, as I mentioned. We have a solar control that would be available here as well. Uh, they will all terminate on that 74 plug. So when we start talking about accessories, Wiesman accessories, so these are specific Wiesman devices that have to communicate with the Wiesman control. Uh, they will wire from their 74 um, output and you're gonna wire those to this little terminal right on the MZIO board here, the 74 uh, plug right at the bottom right-hand corner. And we can daisy chain between the devices so they don't have to bring all of, all of them to this one area. You can go from one control to another if you have multiple devices and then bring back one to the boiler here. So like an end switch, basically, we have all these devices basically communicating together. We just have that one, you know, two wires going back to the, the boiler control for proper communication with the unit. 
They will require you to set up an address because all of these devices are going to be always set to number one when they come on the site. It's going to be up to the installer to change that based on a numbering system on the dial here, this little rotary dial that is part of every one of these boards. And basically, if we have uh, mixing valves, the mixing valve boards will always be numbered as far as priorities. They always get the first three blocks. So if I have three mixing valves in my system, I'm going to have one of the mixing valve extension cases, one, one is two, and one is three. If I have a pump module, that would be four. Uh, if I had a mixing valve extension kit and a pump module, the mixing valve extension kit would be one and the pump module would be two. So there's a priority kind of lo logic there as far as the rotary switches here, just to keep everything kind of logical order for the, the particular boiler control. So it's important that you set those addresses correctly uh, so that the boiler knows when it's communicating with a certain mixing valve or pump module, it's, it's, it's dealing with the right, uh, it's, it's the right, um, devices it's talking to. So this is how it identifies the different boards that it's communicating with that are out there in the in the system. And these are all the boards that we can talk about. So we've got the say the solar modules, we've got the mixing valve modules and the pump modules uh, that we had to work with. We also have these VitaTrol 200E uh, devices. So what these are um, will basically be remote kind of temperature uh, controls uh, as well as boiler controls. So you can wire these somewhere remotely and now the operator can be at a different area of the building and you can kind of monitor this, what's going on in the system. They can also feed back actual temperatures. So they could be, you know, as far as uh, we use them with our heating circuits with these boilers. Uh, so they can control, you know, the temperature in that heating circuit, depending on where they're placed. You want to place them in a fairly good location and they can feed back temperature to the boiler control, giving it that much more information about how well the system is heating up. Uh, and it can basically affect or impact the modulation of that uh, boiler to make sure that we get the right temperature going out to it. Uh, so this is uh, what we call the plus bus uh, side of things. So when it's Wiesmann specific devices communicating back to the boiler, then we use that pink plus bus connection. If, uh, and, and just to kind of finish up on those VitaTrol 200s, a maximum of two of those per system is what we can deal with uh, as far as operations. You won't see three of those in one uh, system. One or two are the max that we can deal with there. Once we deal with, uh, once we get into things like uh, communicating from boiler to boiler, say in a, a cascaded system, where you want to take you know, three or four, two, 16 boilers, whatever you want, and put them in a system, they're going to communicate on a different plug, not the plus bus. We're going to communicate boiler to boiler on the CAN bus. Uh, and we've got the plugs. I'll show you that in a minute. And anything BMS related. So the gateways, for instance, will also communicate in that same CAN bus. So when we get into commercial multiple boiler systems, that's where the CAN bus really starts to kind of be utilized in, in its application. We're going with the Wago uh, style of gateway, uh, and we will have these available in four configurations. You'll see those configurations here on the screen. Uh, they will be coming uh, as a, uh, I believe in a box. There's not enough room in the back of the boiler DIN rail for you to snap these into place, uh, but they will come in their own individual box with their own individual voltage connections, et cetera, that you'll have the ability to purchase that way. Uh, you'll have to know, obviously, what type of platform you're utilizing before you uh, purchase one of these because they are um, they are specific to the different platforms. So you uh, you can't uh, buy a uh, Wago that's for Modbus RTU and expect it to work on the backnet IP. So that's uh, something you have to think about before you purchase. Uh, a couple of things you kind of look at. This is just a, a where this connects into place. So I talked about that CAN bus. On our controls, it's a yellow plug that's identified as 91. And you can see the connection between the WAGO gateway and our, our boilers would be basically terminating that connection on our lead boiler uh, on the 91 plug. And the blue and the red wires are the power connection. So it's a 24 volt power connection to these uh, devices. The line power cable you'll see there the uh, kind of on over the left uh, basically is capable of taking 110 to 230 volt and basically uh, conditioning that to the proper power to the gateway. Recommended uh, basically communication on the 91 plug because there's a communication uh, plug there, you know, keep it away from your line voltage, you know, don't run it along, uh, you know, high voltage cables, et cetera, that, that interference could be problematic. Uh, if you use a proper type of wiring, that tends to be less of an issue. So shielded twisted pair is recommended. 
uh, and up to 650 feet of, of run uh, that we can deal with depending on the gauge there from 22 to 18 gauge uh, cable. And as far as the connections here, so we're wiring into this, it's one of those style where you just uh, you take the screwdriver and pop it, uh, poke it into the uh, insert here, and that opens up the, the wiring connection. So you can slide the, the uh, wire in there, release the, the tab there, take the screwdriver out, and that secures the wire into the connection. Burner wise, uh, we talked about the boiler sizes. So there's the kind of a picture of what the, the burners are going to look like, just to kind of give you a little look on that. Uh, the burners themselves are uh, basically as far as you're concerned is on the installation side, we need to know where the test port is for the gas. We're going to want to check that gas pressure before we start anything up here. So measuring the gas pressure is important. And on the smaller burners, that's on the bottom of the gas valve. We have a little port there. Uh, there's a couple of differences between the smaller burners and the larger burners. It's down at the gas valve itself. So we have a couple of safety switches, a low gas pressure safety switch and a, and a uh, and a high gas pressure safety switch on the smaller burners. The large ones also have a valve proving switch here that checks the basically the safety of the, the seals of the gas valve before things start up. And that same gas connection is at the very bottom of the burner here itself. You'll notice uh, as well that uh, on these units here, a little bit something different that we have not done other boilers before. We've got an O2 or oxygen sensor plugged into both these burners. And uh, we, we're using a, a combustion management system that's going to utilize that auctions and sensor. That sensor is basically calibrated uh, every 60 seconds as the burner's in operation. Um, all indications, it's a very robust uh, sensor, so not a lot of maintenance has to be dealt with on these uh, on these auction sensors. And they're going to dial that uh, combustion in uh, very, very tight to your requirements. So as far as our efficiencies these days with, you know, carbon taxes and stuff like that. We want to burn as little fuel as possible. And anything that helps us basically make sure that happens automatically. So we don't have to sit there with a screwdriver on those gas valves and dial them in as you know, the, the temperature of the air outside changes, et cetera. These types of, of uh, com uh, components are what you need to have that type of capability. So the O2 sensor is going to dial that O2 or that combustion in, uh, essentially to keep that from the full fire range of your burners, you know, from about one, you know, 0.5 to 1% operation. And uh, even in different fuels, as far as its operation there, as we start dealing from, you know, you know, different levels of propane and natural gas, you're still your devi deviation on your O2 on your exhaust side is only going to be about one to 2%. So it, it's really significant change as far as combustion, which is really on the forefront uh, boilers these days is essentially that whole, you know, if we don't burn efficiently, we're, we're getting penalized for it now. So uh, the, the, the cost of your fuel is going up because you're paying the extra tax on that fuel uh, as we consume it. The uh, gas side of it, just kind of the dialing in here, that little isolation valve I talked about earlier with the, on the, uh, with the um, installation fittings kit, there you see it in its, uh, its glory there as we pipe it into our system. You want to keep that rag about 10 feet upstream of the boiler connection that allows any type of pressure uh, to equalize you know, downstream of that regulator. So we're going to overpressurize the gas side of the boiler here. We're trying to maintain about four to 14 inches of gas pressure on high fire to that boiler uh, on natural gas, 10 to 14 inches uh, on high fire on the uh, uh, for for propane. And uh, so we want to ensure that uh, that gas side, we don't have a lot of issues on that. So, you know, we're following the reg the recommendations of the of the regulator manufacturer here to make sure you pipe the, the reg the right way and orientation, et cetera. The following instructions in the manual tend to make this system a lot more successful than, than basically not following the, the proper guidelines. Uh, high lockup pressures and stuff can be really problematic for your boiler. Fluctuating gas uh, pressures can be really problematic for your boiler. So this tends to mitigate those types of problems in your system. Now, this is a slide just showing utilizing those uh, inputs on the NZIO board for things like different safeties, low gas pressure, high gas pressure switches here. I didn't identify the high gas pressure, but it's in the in the red. But we can program and commissioning that basically if we wire something here, we can essentially say that if that switch opens, we're going to create a fault on the boiler. And it's going to be specific to that input. So if the Z1I uh, input is the one that opens, you're going to see an F920 fault on the control. 
If the Z2 or Z2, depending on where you're at here, input is open, then the F921 fault is on the control. So you know exactly if you see these faults on the control, whatever safety connected to these inputs is what the, where the problem's at. So you can use those for these different types of applications. We do have air filters uh, and the air filters are, are basically an option. And the idea there is that uh, if, depending on what your level of contamination, I, I mentioned that uh, we mentioned contaminated air about seven times in the installation manual. It's an important thing to deal with. Uh, it's gonna be problematic. So if, basically if we don't deal with it, it's probably gonna end up in a service call. If we have a lot of fouling of the uh, you know, combustion air and that gets into your combustion system, it just basically creates issues uh, and it's a legacy that basically continues until we address it. So air filters are available. Uh, they are not standard, so you have to order these uh, as well. And we'll, depending on the boiler, there's different packages for these. When I am removing the, basically the, the, the standard combustion air pipe that comes with the boiler, this is standard, I have to take that off to install the, the actual filter itself. So part of the process there you see in the instructions is uh, when we're taking those off, just how to, you know, to remove the, 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 the pipe here first and then put your filter on. The larger burners also have a flange that has to be installed before you put the burner on as well to the to the uh, to the venturi here of the of the boiler or combustion inlet of the boiler uh, that we can uh, we have to add that flange on there as well. So those are the uh, the combustion air dampers if we're using what we call room dependent air. So if there's no connection to the outside, these air filters are available uh, for that application, and you can add in a, a pressure switch there as well. Uh, and the pressure switch wires to the front of the boiler on the burner control unit on the X18 plug. Uh, you have little standard, uh, uh, basically pre-drilled holes that you can mount the uh, air pressure switch. And the air pressure switch will slide into the inlet of the combustion air filter. So when that pressure gets up above that 0.6 inches where you're gonna dial that in, it's going to give you a warning or a fault there that our, our combustion air uh, has a higher pressure drop. So then at that point in time, we need to clean that filter so you can wash it out and you need to dry it before you basically start the burner up. So sometimes it might not be a bad idea to have two filters per burner, have one that's ready to go. And, and so while you're cleaning one, you just throw the, the dry one in there and you just keep rotating those year after year. It makes it a little bit easier to basically do your service. Uh, combustion air I mentioned as well. So again, that combustion air side, if we do have a connection to, uh, you know, bringing the air from the outside, but maybe it's hard, not hard pipe to the boiler, but opening up a damper, there is a, uh, an input device here uh, that if we just want to prove that that device opens, we can just basically take the jumper out of the uh, combustion uh, air input uh, uh, connection here and wire in the proof of that damper opening in that spot. So the burner won't fire until that, that damper fully uh, opens and we get that switch connection telling us there's a proof of opening. We can also wire 24 volts to the device and operate it that actuator right off of the control itself. This depends on what you're dealing with there on that side. The uh, larger boilers, uh, if we are going to do the same idea with the uh, uh, combustion air intake uh, kits, we have these uh, kits available if we're hard piping now to the um, to the boiler. So the six boilers here, there are a couple of different kits depending on the size. Let's have a little quick review of those. So just like we did with the standard room dependent air type of filter, we got to drop that uh, that combustion air pipe off first. Then we're going to uh, basically run our flexible duct to that knockout at the back of the boiler, kind of where that little the conduit is there, we can, we can run that flexible air pipe. And then we are going to take the, uh, the top uh, part of the, uh, where the combustion air inlet to the unit uh, on the fan here is, we put a little bit of tape that comes with the uh, adapter here, slide the adapter on, hose clamp it in place, and then connect your uh, flexible duct to the bottom here. So fairly straightforward. And now you can hard pipe your connection at the back uh, from your outside to the boiler. Uh, if you're dealing with the uh, the uh, the back here, as far as the boiler, so once we get the the front done, you go to the back, and depending on the size of the boiler, there might be an adapter and a reducing coupling that you're going to have to add there for the the, uh, the 399 to 500. The 750 to 1 million don't use that reducing coupling. We just use the the standard adapter at the top here. So it gives you that hard connection at the back here now. 
little clamp here to hold it in place. There's pre-drilled holes in the in the casing of the boiler for that to to hold that in place. So now you got this spot in the back that you can hard pipe and connect that combustion air. With the larger units, there's a couple extra steps. We've got to take that combustion air pipe off. We got a little plate here, a little retaining panel at the back. We got to remove, or at the front, we have to remove as well. And then we have this pan. Uh, we're going to take the adapter uh, off of the pan here, so you, you don't see it here. It's already been removed. You're also going to remove the casters off the bottom of the boiler, and you can slide this pan underneath of the boiler now. Reattach that adapter on the back. So it's on this side here in the back side of the boiler there now. And you'll mount the flexible tube to the, uh, to the filter box if you have that uh, filter box in, in place there. So connections, uh, first we put that uh, sealing tape like we did on the previous, uh, on the smaller boilers. And then we mount the adapter in blue there uh, to the uh, combustion air intake of the boiler or the burner fan. We take the connection now of the, uh, the flexible uh, piping here and with a hose clamp and seal it to our adapter. And then we're gonna take that, uh, the burner flange uh, and we're gonna connect that down to the base of the boiler, uh, basically for the combustion air connection. And then put the, and do the same thing with the, the uh, burner at the bottom there. So do the same kind of repeat it for the two burners uh, on the double decker to make sure that we have both of them connected to the front of the boiler. Then we move around to the back and we take those uh, uh, the, the flexible ducts at the back and we, we connect those with the hose clamps to the two ports at the back of the boiler. Put our plate back on the front and then based on what we have as far as combustion air here, you'll see the, the, the connection here. Uh, we put the uh, coupling and then if we have the smaller boiler, we use the little red reducing coupling for the 1500 uh, just for the reduced size of the combustion air to the unit. There's also filter boxes that we can add in here. So we don't just have to have a uh, you know, combustion air filtered on just a room dependent. We also have these filter block boxes that we can add. And the similar, uh, basically the same uh, filters that we would use for the room dependent air application are used inside the filter boxes. Uh, fairly simple. Like I say, uh, you, you remove the, the latch here first to open up the door. You take the little cover off the front, the little blue cover here, remove that off. You put the uh, filter clamp, basically connect that to the side here of your, of your filter. Tighten that filter clamp into place so we got a good connection here. We're gonna reinstall our little cover. And then if we have the reducer here, depending on the size of the boiler, we're gonna put that reducer on our coupling here so that we have the right combustion air opening. And then the flexible pipe connects to the, between the filter box and of course our combustion air on the, uh, on the side of the boiler here. With the bigger units, as we get into here, as we move into uh, the, the filter box is basically identical as far as connection. So we can have the connection here, uh, hanging the box on the boiler. So we have these two little clamps, brackets here that we would hang first. Then we can hang the boiler off or the filter box off of the boiler directly. With the larger units, we will do the exact same thing, only we have the adapter at the bottom for that, the, the combustion air box versus the conduit that we have in the knockout on the smaller boilers. So very simple um, installation. And we also have, again, the filter uh, pressure uh, switch here for the filter that we can add. It goes to the exact same connection on the, on the X18 plug, does the exact same function uh, that we can add in there. And that's basically to give you warnings if there's a problem. Now with contaminated combustion air, if you have chemicals in your, in your mechanical room, uh, room dependent air is not recommended. Those chemicals will, will, will start to get in there, contaminate and start to impact things like your stainless steel, your boilers, your venting, et cetera. Uh, even having those in the room and off gassing would be problematic for your system. So basically anything chlorines, like pool chemicals, you know, water softening salts, all those things are, are, are corrosive to boiler uh, surface areas, they can be problematic for your combustion components. And we wanna avoid those in those picker systems. So uh, uh, direct connection to the outside for clean combustion air is obviously the, the preferred method, but if you have room dependent air, you really have to be careful about what's being stored in there and you know investigate what's going on and make recommendations if there are things stored there to have those move to a different location. When we get into the venting side of the boiler, uh, we have the siphon on the back. So this is a service item we're going to deal with. 
And when we uh, have the uh, siphon connected here to the back, it's got a little float in it, uh, which will, if it's dry, so there's no basically condensate inside the, uh, inside the siphon or P-trap, that float is closed so that the, uh, there's no uh, uh, flue gas escaping out of the siphon at that particular point in time. It's always recommended to basically fill those up with some water before we uh, start the boiler, but it does have that in there as a safety. If we're adding neutralization uh, tanks, and we'll size these up depending on the size of the, the CI2s that you're working with there. Uh, recommended, recommended that uh, the um, connections are open to atmosphere, which means we're not hard piping uh, to our drains, et cetera, to make sure that there's any issues there that the boiler doesn't get the backup. It basically, the water gets on the floor and there's an issue there as far as water on the floor, but we're not dealing with a fault on the burner because we've you know flooded the burner with condensate. So essentially making sure that uh, we've got that opening here. You see that down here in the bottom, the little atmospheric opening. And also that we drain the properly out of the P-trap. So there's usually a recommendation there to, to make sure that we have a nice, you know, get as close as possible to floor drains, one thing, so we don't have so much run here to deal with. But if the siphon is below where the drain is, or we can't get the proper incline or decline to the drain, we should use a, a condensate pump to make sure that we get that and size correctly for the flow that we get that condensate out of the boiler and basically through your condensate uh, neutralization tanks or to the floor drains. So it doesn't cause an issue with your system. Standard uh, piping here. So we have CPVC uh, capability that 185, as far as your, your, your boiler temperature, CPVC is, is gonna be uh, okay. Uh, we also have a stainless steel and PPS, so fairly standard. Uh, if you guys have been piping boilers for the last you know, 20 years or so, these are fairly standard materials we've been using for a long part of that. Uh, we've got a little adapter uh, connection there um, that will basically uh, connect between the boiler breach and that vent material. So depending on the vent material, there will be an adapter from the vent manufacturer. So you know, you, you have a CI2 uh, 399, there's gonna be a specific adapter from that stainless steel vent manufacturer or from the PPS manufacturer that's going to uh, uh, basically make sure that we can adapt correctly to the back of that boiler. We wanna make sure that that connection is done correctly. Couple of con uh, configurations. So you've got the two pipe configuration here where we have uh, basically exhaust and combustion air going up through the, the, the top of the building. These are fairly standard code requirements as far as the distances and heights. And these are all detailed in the manual for you to make sure that your combustion air is not higher than the exhaust. That always is problematic because of course the, it's going to suck that, that exhaust right back in the combustion air. So generally speaking, you see a little different configuration here of the combustion air. It's a little bit lower. We use the gooseneck on it to make sure that no rain gets in there. Whereas the exhaust side, it's open up here. Any water rain gets in there, it's not a big deal. Uh, we can basically just let that go through the siphon and, and out through the drain. As far as connections and maximal, maximum vent lengths, so if we're looking at uh, the different boilers here, so the first one is just room dependent air, sidewall venting, very basic connection here, probably the most basic of venting connections you can deal with. Uh, we still want to see a, a, a decline back to the boiler of that venting, so make sure that we don't have condensate blocking uh, the uh, the, the exhaust, we wanna get that through that, uh, that uh, siphon and out through the drain as quickly as possible. But what you're looking at here basically is your maximum vent length. So depending on four inch, six inch or eight inch, there's your vent length, you're allowed 198 feet, depending on the boiler size. And when we calculate our vent lengths, we have to add in the equivalent length of any offsets. So when we have things like 90s and Ts and stuff like that, they, they add pressure drop. And we, we uh, give you that information here in the vent tables. So depending on the type of venting we're dealing with, four inch, your 45s are equivalent to about three feet. Whereas a six inch to eight inch, it's five feet of equivalent length for every 45 and every 90 is gonna be eight feet or 10 feet, depending on that, uh, depending on what you're utilizing there as far as diameter. So just be wary of that. You gotta add that up and be within that vent table or if you're outside of it, uh, basically at that point in time, you can contact Wiesman and we can have a look at it. And, and based on the information and pressure drop, we could recommend possibly a larger diameter size or something like that. But we generally like you to keep within the vent tables. And if you have to go outside of those, we can have a, we can have a discussion there. Uh, as long as you know, you know what your system looks like, you'd have to draw it out for us. We could probably get back to you whether or not that would be possible to do. And like I say, it might be a change in diameter, et cetera. As far as your terminations, on single uh, 
on single exhaust systems. You can see them here. So basically just kind of keep in mind your, your, your grades. We want to be at 12 inches above grade or above your anticipated snow level. So in Canada, that could be very different from you know, coast to coast. So we want to make sure we allocate for that. If you can't get above your uh, grade or snow load, you can use the, the snorkel kind of uh, idea here. Be very careful with this configuration in the bottom right because you have a natural water trap right in this offset right here where we go 90 up uh, outside. We wanna make sure that you still have a good uh, decline to the boiler here. Otherwise you're gonna have a buildup of condensate here and eventually it blocks off that, uh, that connection or reduces it significantly enough that the boiler has too much back pressure, it can't fire up. So be careful of that. And just some general rules as far as how far out those, those vent pipes should be. Uh, the farther they are out, of course, the more, depending on your area, the, they could freeze up and you could have some problems there. So maximum about three feet off the wall, minimum about two inches off the wall is what they recommend. On our single wall vertical systems, which basically vertical is a little better. It's always got draft in it. And it's kind of, you know, naturally that's where flue gas wants to go is up. Uh, we have the same vent, uh, basically equivalent length, so 198 feet, whether it's horizontal or vertical. Uh, your elbows will still mean all the same stuff here. It's just your termination looks a little bit different than it does on the sidewall. It's about the big difference here. So we're still going to add up the offsets to the overall length here, and we're going to add that into that calculation. It gets a little trickier when you talk about two uh, two pipe systems here. So now we're hard piping that combustion air. Maybe you got that filter box on there and stuff like that, that we're, that we're dealing with. Uh, we still have exact same equivalent lengths with two pipe, but now you're adding your A plus your B. So notice that there's an A there for exhaust and B for the combustion air. So you're going to have to calculate all those offsets. And then you're going to have to take a, a lineal foot of measurement here, put that stuff together on um, both combustion air and the exhaust. And that's gonna be that total equivalent length and it cannot exceed 198 feet, all right? So it's gotta be the same uh, length uh, A plus B here. We can't exceed that 198 feet even though we've got, you know, adding in combustion air here. And on a two pipe uh, outside wall here, on a sidewall system here, uh, the recommendations that we have, exact same thing, uh, really, it's really simple as far as your, your venting. You know, it's 198 feet any way you go. You got to add up your elbows. You got to add up your equivalent length, whether it's combustion air and exhaust or just combustion or just exhaust. And you have to stay within that 198 feet. It's really simple as far as what we need to do here and add those together. Uh, if we come up under 198 feet, you're gold. You can go ahead and do that. Always remember on any horizontal transition, though, and I can't impact this enough, is that you want to grade that back so we get that condensate out of that vent system. And a two pipe uh, system here, sorry, two pipe system on both uh, basically vertically terminated. Uh, we saw a picture of this uh, in the little preview there talking about the different code requirements for your distances as you terminate on the roofs. But uh, same idea, we're just adding those uh, numbers together. So even these elbows at the top here added into that equivalent length. So you gotta look at the gooseneck, those are part of the termination and they're gonna be added in uh, to the overall length of your exhaust. And we're gonna come up and make sure we're under 198 feet for those as well. And we should be good to go. Now, these are minimums that we look at in the sidewall. Uh, and like I say, depending on your location, is 36 inches enough distance between those? We don't know. Uh, we're giving you what the minimums are, but that's not like, you know, minimum is the standard. We basically, we have to look at site specific locations and maybe 10 feet is what you need here instead of 36 inches. It's, it's all based on, do we want that flue gas to get sucked right back into the combustion air intake and be a problem? If it's a problem and it's, you know, 36 inches was kept there and like, well, I followed your manual, it's 36 inches, but there's other parts of the manual. Things like if there's, you know, if this is the kind of the prevailing wind side of the building, you as the installer have to make basically uh, plans for that. So whether you fence that area to make sure you buffer the wind or or increase the distance between those those offsets, that's really up to the guy on site to make sure that those are that's done correctly. Uh, if it's a problem, uh, basically it, it essentially is going to impact the overall longevity of that boiler's life in that system. So very important to kind of look at these areas and as a as a manufacturer. And as a, you know, looking at stuff in the tech, we, we understand and know now after years and years of operation, you know, if these things are too close and we start getting flue gas recirculation, it, do, it does have a, a large and significant impact on the overall 
you know, operation of that boiler and its, and its life cycle. If we have uh, two boilers, multiple boilers connected together with their own exhausts, so this is not common venting, this is the two boilers and two exhausts, then of course the same idea here, 36 inches apart for the exhaust is recommended. And if we're going vertical, then we keep those distances about four inches on, uh, basically from the closest point as they go through that, they go through that chase. So just some general rules there to make sure that we got something going on. We get into common venting. We're almost, we just rounded the corner. I should be able to finish this up uh, before we get to the uh, bewitching hour here. So the common venting of these boilers, uh, standard rules that we have to remember here, uh, there's no sidewall venting. So always vertical uh, terminations on common vented systems. We only have a maximum of four boilers that can be, can be connected, connected to one common vent system. That doesn't mean you can't have multiple common vent systems in a boiler room though. You can have more than, uh, you know, more than four boilers in a boiler room, but only four of them can be connected to one single common vent system. They should be all the same size. So we wanna make sure all the capacities of these boilers will be all the same. So they're all 399s, they're all 500s, they're all 2 millions, whatever you're dealing with there. No CPVC. So we do not have approval of CPVC on the exhaust vent. So make sure you remember that CPVC, v, CPVC venting is very expensive in those diameters. You'd be ashamed to have to tear all that stuff out after you finish it. So make sure you read the manual. It's, it's not approved in the common venting side. It is approved in single. And we're dealing with the equivalent lengths. Uh, again, the whole idea is you add up your equivalent lengths here and it can't exceed 198, 198 feet for the 399 to 1 million. BTU systems, uh, 1.5 uh, million BTU boilers can be a, uh, 131 feet of a overall length and 2 million BTUs for the uh, 164 feet for the largest boilers that we can deal with. So that's going to be a uh, combined length. So what's that mean uh, here? Maximum equivalent vent uh, length includes the longest of each of the following combined air intakes, flue gas vent from boiler to common header. So what that means is that when I'm doing the vent calculation, I'm not taking the the overall vent from the closest boiler to the to the um, to the vertical here. I'm going to go all the way back to the boiler that's the farthest away, and I'm going to make the calculation from that guy to make sure that the guy that has the most venting on it is still within the vent tables. Now there is the ability if you've got vent manufacturers they want to recalculate things. We do show in the manual we got about 2.4 inches of static pressure available at the uh, at the outlet of that boiler. So once the fan's on, we got that you know 2.4 inches there. Uh, if they wanna take the responsibility, they can revise the vent system uh, with that information. So you supply them with that information and they can configure your vent. And now it becomes the onus is on the vent manufacturer that, uh, that's going to perform correctly. The added component when we have common venting systems for the boiler will be the damper at the back of the boiler. So you'll see that uh, take off here. So depending on the you know, we've got the different size boilers here. You're gonna have the vent collar couplings. There's two of them, one on either side of your damper. Your vent damper in blue is sitting in between the middle of those. It's gonna be depending on the size of your, your vent would be the size of that damper. And of course, you're gonna to connect to that approved venting that we have. So either stainless steel or uh, PPS, no CPVC. And in the manual, it tells you, you can go about five degrees. So basically we can go between five degrees offset on that vent damper. Uh, as far as how we can how we can uh, install it, so kind of keep those things in mind, and you'll be successful in your uh, connection of that vent damper to your system. And when we're wiring that, we're going to pull the jumper out of the 18 and 19, and basically we wire the vent damper to 18 and 19 for the proof of of opening, and the power for the actuator is going to be on the 20 and 21 output. So as far as uh, it's one of the easiest uh, common vent manuals I've ever kind of uh, had a look at. It's basically, uh, we look at the different sizes. So depending on if you have two boilers or four boilers, remember those are limitations. We're gonna have a specific uh, basically size of our header here. So the connections from the boiler to the header are whatever the size of the vent diameter in, of the boiler itself is going to be. But when we're doing common venting, we're concerned about the size of this manifold and our vertical. So with four boilers, depending on the, you know, whether they're four 399s, because this is four boilers in each one of these installations here, we would have a 10 inch diameter, basically manifold here, 
12 inch for the 500, all the way up to eight inch, 18 inch diameter on the largest two million BTU boiler. So that's the that's the green here we're looking at. So depending on the configurations here, that, that's your that's your size. Really simple to kind of identify. When we get into the uh, combustion air side of the boilers, we know what the green means, the, the different diameters of those venting. Uh, if you're doing individual combustion air uh, to the outside from each boiler, you just use the size that is connected to the boiler. We reviewed that uh, a little bit uh, as we went through there earlier. If we're going to common uh, do a common combustion air as well, we have a table in here. So the purple now, so we have all those connection combustion air together. And depending on the number of boilers, you got a really simple layout here. So if it's the uh, four 399s up to um, the uh, 15 at 1.5 million, it's going to be a 12 inch manifold. It goes up to 16 inch on the 2.0 million. So fairly straightforward as far as your combustion air connections, if you want to ma manifold that as well to the outside. I think that's it. I'm running out of uh, I'm running out of voice, actually. So it's a good thing we got to the end here. So how would we how do we make out gents? Are we uh, we made out good? All the questions have been no answered, questions. I believe. You guys are on the questions. Excellent. With that, we'll All sign right. off. Okay, you guys have a guys. great Bye. day. Take care. Thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next time.